This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. It's Thursday at 3 o'clock and time for another Condo Insider Show. Hawaii's show about association living and our challenges. And I just want to remind everybody who's watching, first of all, thank you. And second, if you want to call our hotline with a question, it's area code 808-374-2014. Today we're going to be talking about our city council and all the things going on down there with regard to condominiums and, and safety issues, some of it promulgated by their recent fire at Marco Polo. And I'm very lucky to have with me one of my favorite people in Hawaii and, and one of my co-hosts on Condo Insider, Jane Sugimura. It's good to have you here and see you again. Yes, thanks for having me back on the show. Just briefly remind everybody a little bit about uh, who you are. And you actually had a very prominent story in the newspaper recently all about you and all the things you've done. And I've always said you're the godmother of <laughs> associations in Honolulu. You seem to know everything about all associations and everybody involved. So just remind everybody a little, little bit about you. Well, it, it's probably because I've been around for so long. and. Um, I'm an attorney, and I'm a partner with Bendet Fidel Sugimura, and we do commercial litigation I re and real estate transactions. I represent uh, commercial landlords. That's what I do mostly. And I've been president of uh, the Hawaii Council of, of Community Associations for uh, almost 20 years, I guess. And I've been, I've been an advocate for longer than that. And we've been uh, advocating for the interests of condominiums, and uh, condominium association uh, uh, residents and boards for all of those years. And so we've been dealing with a myriad of issues, but today we're talking about the city and county of Honolulu. Right, but we can say this, that Condo Insider is sponsored by the Hawaii Council of Community yes. Associations. Yes. We, we I did. mean, this doesn't come for free in the sense that uh, we appreciate the nonprofit work of Think Tech Hawaii, but it costs money to put these shows on. and and your association has been very generous in providing funds to, to provide education. Yes, and we, we feel that it's, it's important because the, the reason these uh, shows started was because we heard complaints by legislators that they got from their constituents that they couldn't go to the CAI or the Hawaii Council um, seminars. And so that's why you know we're doing these Think Tech uh, Condo Insider shows. They're free. And they're 28 minutes of you know really good important information, and um, they can watch them anytime they want to. So nobody has any excuse for not you know educating themselves about condo issues. Yeah, well, it's 24/7 on YouTube, and we've had great feedback. And we certainly would invite any of our viewers to send us an email if you have suggestions for shows or ideas for topics, because uh, every year in the legislature we see. Uh, efforts to make education mandatory for board members, which, how do you feel about that? Um, I think it's important, and that's, that's why we exist. I mean, that's one of our primary uh, goals is to educate board members and people who live in condos about issues that, you know, uh, relate to that. And, but, you know, uh, and, I, and I think that there are programs and resources available uh, that provide those uh, that education. It's just that boards have to make themselves available, and I, I do that. I mean, at our seminars, we 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 you know have the list of YouTube shows posted, and they're on our website. And we tell people to go and uh, look at the YouTube shows, to come to our seminars, to go to our website, and to to you know. Uh, and I think that's what we have to do. We have to just make make sure that the resources are there. So that people can go and use them. You think they should mandate education? I think mandating is hard because you know the people who serve on boards are volunteers, and if they were required to uh, go to you know take these classes, I'm pretty sure they probably wouldn't, and then people would probably resign from the boards if that was going to be a mandatory requirement. I do think that maybe that they should be required to take a, a you know like an ABC seminar, like CAI has uh, you know, done in the past. And what that is, it's, a, it's an all-day seminar that tells board members, basically new board members, what they can expect. 
and what, what is going to be, uh, what they're obligated under the state law and under their condo documents to do, and to explain to them what their role is in, in, in you know, uh, being on the board. And I think that's important, and, and I don't think I would really have a whole lot of opposition to something like that. And they could do it either by going to a seminar, like CAI's ABC seminar, or, if, in fact, we have a YouTube show, right? We, as, in fact, there, Correct. we have a YouTube, sh a YouTube show on Condo Insider regarding what board members can do. And if they can, you know, look at those, you know, YouTube videos, I think that that should qualify as uh, to satisfy a, a requirement for education. So I think there, there are ways that you can do this where, you know, it, it wouldn't be onerous and people would still be able to serve on the board with, you know, uh, without a whole lot of um, uh, additional time by, you know, trying to, re uh, to, to comply with mandatory provisions set out by the state. Yeah, my general concern has been that, uh, you know, one size doesn't fit all. You have right. 20 unit condos, five unit condos, thousand unit condos. You have parking condos, senior living condos, agricultural community condos. And to try to legislate one educational program would only deter people from serving on the board. Yes, I agree. And, and probably very, very difficult to uh, um, enforce. Yes. Yeah. And that being said, I use my favorite expression, one size doesn't fit all. You know, I've been doing this a long time like you have, and uh, I, I think I've seen more activity this year with our city council. We always had some activity here or there, you know, the refuse pickup and some other things in the past. But really, we haven't seen much condo-related stuff until we had the mega fire of Marco Polo and what I'm going to call the mega railing problem of the Alamoana Shopping Center. And all of a sudden, I now see a, a bunch of activity and thoughts of, uh, by the city council, almost one size fits all. And let's talk about a couple of those initiatives. Okay. Let's talk about uh, a bill recently, I think introduced by Councilman Ozawa, but uh, there's been amendments proposed by other council members. Bill 17, which to me generated because of the unfortunate and sad death of Alan Wanting Shopping Center when railings gave way. Yes, yes. So what is, what is this bill about? What are they trying to do? Uh, the bill is, it, it requires all high rises, well anything over three stories, so I guess that would include some townhouses, but three stories and over, um, to have uh, an inspection done of the exterior of the building. Now I think it's called a building envelope inspection. And that would mean for a high rise, you know, dropping, doing scaffolding and doing drops, you know, from the top of the building all the way down and actually having people look at the building. And in the bill, it only says it can be done by a professional engineer. And you know, that's one of our uh, criticisms or, or concerns regarding you know, uh, Bill 17. And, and Bill 17 is a bill that one size fits all. And we've been trying to educate the council that you know, condos are different. They're you know, all types of sizes of building, just like you said. Uh, with different types of uses and you just can't do a one-size-fits-all and especially when there's a state law that requires condominiums to have a, to comply with a budget and reserve law that says that you have a reserve study and that you will do certain repairs on a schedule and that schedule would Im include doing a building envelope inspection every time you paint your building which is done every seven to ten years I mean, you have to inspect the building because before you paint, if there are any spalling, any cracks in the concrete, that has to be repaired. And so before they can paint the building, they have to inspect the building to see if there are any cracks that have to be repaired. And as they do their, their inspection of the, uh, of the exterior building, and I know in my condo, when they do it, they check the lanai's. And when they check the lanai's, they check the railings to see if they're secure. And so. Um, so this is, you know, and, 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 and typically the buildings have to do this every seven to ten years. And so our, our position on this bill is if we are in fact doing it, why do we have to do it again? Yeah. Well, how are they going to administer it? Is, is it? Does this bill propose that it be done for a building over a certain age and every so many years? Or? It, 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 right now it says it would apply to any building over ten years old. And that, and and the original bill says five years, but I think the CD one, which is the uh, the amendment, the proposed amendment, 
is talking about 10 years. So it would be done every 10 years. So this association would have to, with, and within every 10 years, in theory, hire, a, under the current bill, an engineer, which is uh, expensive, and for that engineer who's going to be careful of the word inspection and the liability, he's going to want to drop scaffolding and drops and go look at the windows, look at the railings. I mean, the railings are pretty easy to get to, but right. if, if that's too broad, the word inspection, everybody's going to be concerned about liability and you're going to be talking about a major expense for an association to do it. Right, and it, we're talking, and there was testimony at the last hearing about a building in town, 43 stories. And it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to do one of these building envelope inspections because right now they're in the process of doing an inspection uh, in connection with a paint job for the, uh, for the building. And it's going to cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. So let's assume that this bill 17 passes. And so this downtown building, they've spent all this money and they've spent three months with the scaffolding and everything and doing the inspection, that means they have to turn around and hire another engineer to do the same thing and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's just a terrible waste of money and it's an, a tremendous burden on the association. Oh, it's gonna be a, a miserable, expensive ordeal because as I see it, everybody's conservative for liability reasons and so that engineer is gonna be ultra conservative and what really is the building envelope? Because to me what they're looking for is loose con loose concrete and loose railings. Right. There's so much else you can argue is a part of a building envelope or not part of the envelope. So what you really are saying in this bill, or what I think they're saying, is they want uh, someone to look to see if there's any loose concrete, which could have structural impact, and B, whether there's any loose railings. Right. And so why not just say that, and why not, I'm asking you, why not just say well, that's that this should be done in, in conjunction with your your regular maintenance of your painting. Well, you know, after the last hearing, uh, Council Member Fukunaga has asked for, you know, suggested revisions to her CD1. And one of the suggestions I made was, you have to define building envelope inspection. What I exactly are you requiring by this bill? And so that would then incorporate exactly what you said. I mean, what are they looking at? They're only looking at the exterior walls and the railings to make sure that they're safe. And so that could be, uh, incorporated into the bill. We also want the, uh, the, the definition of who can do this inspection to be expanded so that it includes more than a professional engineer because when the, when the painting company comes to you know, do their building envelope inspection prior to painting the building, it's not an engineer, it's a licensed contractor. And so, and, an, and, and one other thing that, uh, the really important thing that we uh, want is we want to have Buildings who are in compliance with the state requirement for building, you know, for, for budget and reserves, and they uh, periodically do this building envelope inspection, whether they're doing a paint job or they're putting in windows or doing something to the exterior of the building that would, in, in, would, would uh, uh, include a building envelope inspection, that they be allowed to file maybe a one-page document saying, we've done that and here's our paperwork. Here's our contract that shows exactly what was done, signed by the licensed contractor, and here's the bill that we paid to show that we did it, and so we should be exempt from having the, uh, uh, um, the um, Bill 17 inspection by a professional engineer. And you know, those are some of the suggestions that we made uh, to Council Member Fukunaga for to be made to this bill. Well, that all makes sense to me. We're gonna take a short break, but before we do, that I want to come back and talk about the uh, Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee resulting from the fire. But my comment would be, I'm working now with an association that has some th theoretical spalling concrete issues. And what they've done is they've gone to a general contractor who specializes in spalling, who's doing all the investigation and inspection. They're not hiring an engineer to do it. It's too expensive. Right. You know, and, and this is somewhat mundane. The repairs to this type of work are rather simplistic. They should be done for safety reasons but right. uh, and building integrity reasons, but uh, it doesn't make much sense to me. But let's take a little one-minute break and come back and talk about the Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense. Bye. 
Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're having a great discussion with Jane Sugimura, who's a local attorney and president of the Hawaii Council of Community Association, who sponsors this program. And I would encourage all of you board members and even owners who want to know more about our industry uh, to join the Hawaii Council of Community Association. It's open to everybody. I think if you're an individual, not an association, it's like $10 a year, so right. it doesn't cost much money. We have a website with lots of information, but uh, you'll have a good source of knowledge from these shows as well as our seminars and, and know that we're out there uh, trying to make sure legislation pass uh, makes sense for an association. Well, we talked about briefly this Bill 17, and, and I certainly would tell everybody out there it's important that you speak up to your council members if you're in favor or against it because they will listen to their constituents from my experience. And if you leave it just to a few hardened diehards like Jane and I, you know, it's much better to have the numbers when you go to the city council yes, and have people support it. But after the Marco Polo fire, we had a media bill put in mandating allegedly all non-sprinkler buildings, all of them, the 360 approximately, had to retrofit their buildings within five years. And then there was another bill that passed. Uh, the other one's still out there. Basically setting up a Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee. Yes. What is that and who's a member of it? What it's all, what's uh, that all about? Okay, the, the, fi <coughs> the Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee is a group of um, uh, city officials led by the fire department. The fire chief uh, is uh, setting up, uh, he has set it up. And in fact, uh, and, um, uh, Hawaii Council is a member and uh, CAI is also got a member on, on the uh, panel. And uh, I believe the Hawaii Association of Realtors may have a member on the panel. But other than that, everybody is a city official, so we're kind of like outnumbered. Um, uh, the fire department is leading the uh, panel, and on it you have a uh, representative from the City Budget and Finance Committee, from Department of Planning and Permitting, the Board of Water Supply, even the mayor's office has a representative. But I think, I, when I counted it, I think there were eight or nine city offices or city agencies represented, and there's maybe two or three of us non-government people. Well, on the surface, I think you and I would both agree that we want to thank all the first responders who handled all of the uh, fires we have or other types of events. Uh, they work hard, they put their lives at risk, and we certainly want to have the residents of the building and the first responders as safe as we possibly can. Yes, I totally agree with that. And But the problem is you take buildings built 40 years ago and the, the building code was different. Even though they've get, given some wild estimates uh, in the paper, I don't think anyone really knows what it's going to cost to retrofit these things. Right. Well. There was another co committee in 2005 after the first interstate, I think it was the first interstate bank building on uh, South King Street, uh, had a big fire at the, on the, in the, in the um, there was a jewelry manufacturing facility on the top floor of that building, and it was a fire. And I uh, w served on that committee as well. And during that committee work, when we were working with the fire department, what we did is we volunteered, because we went back and forth about the cost. And, a, a, and after a while, I said, you know, our organization, we have members. We can give you buildings, and your, your consultants can go in and actually look at the building and come up with an estimate. So we do have estimates for five buildings. One was a Marco Polo. One was my building, Pearl One. 
and we had a uh, royal court right across from the Blaisdell. I can't remember the fourth one, but I, but you know, Marco Polo because it had almost 600 units, they came in at like three thousand dollars per unit. And that's an average. In my building, it was eight point five to ten thousand per unit, and uh, you know, and you know, the smaller you got, I think royal court was almost twelve because they were smaller. They they were like a hundred and. 60 unit, mine was 300, and Marco Polo was 600. But that was 12 years ago. Yeah, you know, to my perception of this is, again, what is retrofitting? If you're talking about having a warehouse environment, you're just putting in the pipes, that's one thing. But it's not going to be very aesthetic. Where are the soffits to cover it and make it right. look like your home? But then you go into an older building, it's theoretically possible you're going to have issues of remediation of asbestos. You may have remediation of lead paint which would probably triple or quadruple the cost. And, and the engineers that I have talked to on retrofitting of fire sprinkler systems in 2017, they're estimating average twenty-five dollars to $50,000 a unit. Oh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. I mean, now let's look at, and, I'm, and no disrespect to our governor, but and, you know, he's done a good job of getting our air conditioning in our classrooms, but my recollection, they were talking six to ten thousand a classroom, and it's more like sixty to a hundred thousand dollars a classroom. Mm -hmm. We're in a difficult construction environment, and if you looked at having a let's just say a fifty thousand dollar assessment on an owner, you're talking, you know, four or five hundred dollars a month additional in maintenance fees. So right. there's probably a, a lack of economic viability to some of that. Right. And, and I, you know, the, the mayor's bill, I know he's doing it, you know, because he's concerned, uh, and I'm sure he's, he's gotten a lot of calls about, you know, what are we going to do? You need to do something. And so he came up with this idea. But, you know, my concern about the, the mayor's bill, it's a one-size-fits-all, and it calls for immediate retrofitting, and there's not enough contractors in the state of Hawaii to do the retrofitting because you're talking about uh, 18 to two, you know, 18 to 24 months to do one building. You're talking 360 buildings, and uh, the the financing for this project is just, you know, is just something that's not going to happen. And I think the bill does not recognize that buildings are different. Buildings are different. The people who live in them are different, and that condos, uh, the, you know, condos, you know, are a democracy. And so it's not like, you know, you can mandate something and it's going to happen immediately. Uh, because practically speaking, the condo has to pay for it. And, and, if, and, and, and in fact, at the, at the city council hearing, one of the council members asked one of the speakers, how much money does your condominium have set aside for retrofitting? And of course, that person was a unit owner. He didn't, he didn't know. But so when, I came, when it was my turn to speak, I said, I have the answer to that. The answer is zero. Okay, the answer is zero. No condo has money for retrofitting because nobody, nobody has told us we have to do it and it's not in anybody's budget. And so until it's in somebody's budget, we're not going to st start saving money for it. And that's the problem. And if, they, and, so, and if we don't have it in our budget, that means we need to borrow it. And in order to borrow it, you need to get more than 50% of the owners to vote for the loan and in many buildings in Oahu, you have more than 50% of your people living in places like China and Korea and Japan. And so even if you wanted to do it, it's really difficult to get the appropriate vote. And, and very expensive. And very expensive. Let me just share with you a thought I had on yeah. this. And I'm not saying that I'm right or wrong, but, you know, they had the big fire in Dubai, and it was like, I forget how many, 20 stories were ruined. And it had a fire sprinkler system, but the fire sprinkler system didn't put out the fire. However, they had a modern fire alarm system and no one got hurt. It seems to me sprinklers protect property, alarm systems protect people. Mm -hmm. You can retrofit fire alarm systems to the modern code for $1,000 to $2,000 a unit. There may be some exceptions based on engineering of a building, but $1,000 to $2,000 a unit. It seems to me that it would make more sense as a process to focus on taking care of the people, which is what alarms do. Mm -hmm. And if your association, you've given them new alarm system in place, and maybe you've upgraded your fire doors uh, in the exit stairwells to the new code, they should maybe be given a pass because of the fact that uh, it's just too expensive to try to do this fire retrofit. You know something, what you're talking, what you have just described is what the city of Chicago did. 
when, when they enacted uh, an ordinance to deal with mandatory retrofitting after a, a horrific fire in downtown Chicago, and it was the last in a series of fires where there were deaths. And in this one, it, there were six people who died. And the city of Chicago decided to do mandatory retrofitting. But they adopted a system called a life system evaluation. And what they did, the fire department went and they evaluated 220 buildings. And they scored them. In other words, if you had an interior corridor with a dead end, right, so you couldn't get out, that's a minus. And so they had three, three categories. One was structure, one was equipment, and one was programmed. So they looked at the building, because you can't change the building. Buildings are different. You can't change it. They're good or they're bad. In Honolulu, Marco Polo had an interior corridor. And we were told that if you don't have an interior corridor and your entrances are on the outside, that's a plus. Okay? And so, and, and so there, and it, for equipment, you have a super duper fire alarm system, that's a plus. If you have a, a, an old one, that's a minus. And for programs, if you have an a, a emergency evacuation system, if you've got, you know, a 60% owner occupancy rate and everybody's on board and you're doing fire drills and everybody's aware, you have fire extinguishers and you have all these things, these are pluses. Okay. Well, we're down to our last minute, so I'm going to ask you, and are you optimistic this committee will be able to address these issues? I think so, because the, the, the chief said at the last hearing that he's talking about ranking buildings, so it looks like he's looking at the Chicago system. Yeah. And, and that w the takes into account the differences in the buildings. It allows buildings uh, to, you know, so that they, there's, a, there's a scoring system. So some will have to do the mandatory retrofitting and some will not. Well, no pun intended, but this is a hot topic. And, uh, and I can tell you now that the industry is working hard to uh, get the best results for our, all the association members and the boards. We want to thank you for watching Condo Insider. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and thank you, Jane, for being here. Oh, Aloha. thank you. Thank you.